In Defense of Women by H. L. Mencken Chapter 2 The War Between the Sexes Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The War Between the Sexes 6. How Marriages Are Arranged I have said that women are not sentimental, that is, not prone to permit mere emotion and illusion to corrupt their estimation of a situation. The doctrine, perhaps, will raise a protest. The theory that they are is itself a favorite sentimentality. One sentimentality will be brought up to substitute another. Dog will eat dog. But an appeal to a few obvious facts will be enough to sustain my contention, despite the vast accumulation of romantic rubbish to the contrary. Turn, for example, to the field in which the two sexes come most constantly into conflict, and in which, as a result, their habits of mind are most clearly contrasted, to the field, to wit, of monogamous marriage. Surely no long argument is needed to demonstrate the superior competence and effectiveness of women here, and therewith their greater self-possession, their saner weighting of considerations, their higher power of resisting emotional suggestion. The very fact that marriages occur at all is a proof, indeed, that they are more cool-headed than men, and more adept at employing their intellectual resources, for it is plainly to a man's interest to avoid marriage as long as possible, and as plainly to a woman's interest to make a favorable marriage as soon as she can. The efforts of the two sexes are thus directed, in one of the capital concerns of life, to diametrically antagonistic ends. Which side commonly prevails? I leave the verdict to the jury. All normal men fight the thing off. Some men are successful for relatively long periods. A few extraordinarily intelligent and courageous men, or perhaps lucky ones, escape altogether. But taking one generation with another, as everyone knows, the average man is duly married and the average woman gets a husband. Thus the great majority of women, in this clear-cut and endless conflict, make manifest their substantial superiority to the great majority of men. Not many men worthy of the name gain anything of net value by marriage, at least as the institution is now met with in Christendom. Even assessing its benefits at their most inflated worth, they are plainly overborne by crushing disadvantages. When a man marries, it is no more than a sign that the feminine talent for persuasion and intimidation, that is, the feminine talent for survival in a world of clashing concepts and desires, the feminine competence and intelligence, has forced him into more or less abhorrent compromise with his own honest inclinations and best interests. Whether that compromise be a sign of his relative stupidity or of his relative cowardice, it is all one. The two things, in their symptoms and effect, are almost identical. In the first case, he marries because he has been clearly bowled over in combat of wits. In the second, he resigns himself to marriage as the safest form of liaison. In both cases, his inherent sentimentality is the chief weapon in the hand of his opponent. It makes him cherish the fiction of his enterprise, and even of his daring, in the midst of the most crude and obvious operations against him. It makes him accept as real the bold play-acting that women always excel at, and at no time more than when stalking a man. It makes him, above all, see a glamour of romance in a transaction which, even at its best, contains almost as much gross trafficking at bottom as the sale of a mule. A man in full possession of the modest faculties that nature commonly apportions to him is at least far enough above idiocy to realize that marriage is a bargain in which he gets the worst of it, even when, in some detail or other, he makes a visible gain. He never, I believe, wants all that the thing offers and implies. He wants, at most, no more than certain parts. He may desire, let us say, a housekeeper to protect his goods and entertain his friends, but he may shrink from the thought of sharing his bathtub with anyone, and home cooking may be downright poisonous to him. He may yearn for a son to pray at his tomb, and yet suffer acutely at the mere approach of relatives-in-law. He may dream of a beautiful and complacent mistress, lex exigent and mercurial than any a bachelor may hope to discover, and stand aghast at admitting her to his bank book, his family tree, and his secret ambitions. 
He may want company and not intimacy, or intimacy and not company. He may want a cook and not a partner in his business, or a partner in his business and not a cook. But in order to get the precise thing or things that he wants, he has to take a lot of other things that he doesn't want, that no sane man, in truth, could imaginably want. And it is to the enterprise of forcing him into this almost Armenian bargain that a woman of his, quote, choice addresses herself. Once the game is fairly set, she searches out his weaknesses with the utmost delicacy and accuracy, and plays upon them with all her superior resources. He carries a handicap from the start. His sentimental and unintelligent belief in theories that she knows quite well are not true, for instance, the theory that she shrinks from him, and is modestly appalled by the banal carnalities of marriage itself, gives her a weapon against him which she drives home with instinctive and compelling art. The moment she discerns his sentimentality bubbling within him, that is, the moment his oafish smirks and eye-rolling signify that he has achieved the intellectual disaster that is called falling in love, he is hers to do with as she will. Save for acts of God, he is forthwith as good as married. 7. The Feminine Attitude This sentimentality in marriage is seldom, if ever, observed in women. For reasons that we shall examine later, they have much more to gain by the business than men, so they are prompted by their cooler sagacity to enter upon it on the most favorable terms possible, and with the minimum admixture of disarming emotion. Men almost invariably get their mates by the process called falling in love, save among the aristocracies of the North and Latin men. The marriage of convenience is relatively rare. A hundred men marry, quote, beneath them to every woman who perpetrates the same folly. And what is meant by this so-called falling in love? What is meant by it is a procedure whereby a man accounts for the fact of his marriage after feminine initiative and generalship have made it inevitable by enshrouding it in a purple maze of romance, in brief, by setting up the doctrine that an obviously self-possessed and mammalian woman, engaged deliberately in the most important adventure of her life, and with the keenest understanding of its utmost implications, is a naive, tender, moody, and almost disembodied creature, enchanted and made perfect by a passion that has stolen upon her unawares, and which she could not acknowledge even to herself without blushing to death. By this preposterous doctrine, the defeat and enslavement of the man is made glorious, and even gifted with a torch of flattering naughtiness. The sheer horsepower of his wooing has assailed and overcome her maiden majesty. She trembles in his arms, he has been granted a free franchise to work his wicked will upon her. Thus do the ambulant images of God cloak their shackles proudly, and divert the judicious with their boastful shouts. Women, it is almost needless to point out, are much more cautious about embracing the conventional hocus-pocus of the situation. They never acknowledge that they have fallen in love, as the phrase is, until the man has formally avowed the delusion, and so cut off his retreat. To do otherwise would be to bring down upon their heads the mocking and contumely of all their sisters. With them, falling in love thus appears in the light of an afterthought, or perhaps more accurately, in the light of a contagion. The theory, it would seem, is that the love of the man, laboriously avowed, has inspired it instantly, and by some unintelligible magic, that it was non-existent until the heat of his own flame set it off. This theory, it must be acknowledged, has a certain element of fact in it. Woman seldom allows herself to be swayed by emotion while the principal business is yet afoot and its issue still in doubt. To do so would be to expose a degree of imbecility that is confined only to the half-wits of the sex. But once the man is definitely committed, she frequently unbends a bit, if only as a relief from the strain of a fixed purpose, and so, throwing off her customary inhibitions, she indulges in the luxury of a more or less forced and mawkish sentiment. It is, however, almost unheard of for her to permit herself this relaxation before the sentimental intoxication of the man is assured. To do otherwise, that is to confess even post facto to an anterior descent, would expose her, as I have said, to the scorn of all other women. Such a confession would be an admission that emotion had gotten the better of her at the critical intellectual moment, and in the eyes of women, 
as in the eyes of the small minority of genuinely intelligent men, no treason to the higher cerebral centers could be more disgraceful. 8. The Male Beauty This disdain of sentimental weakness, even in those higher reaches where it is mellowed by aesthetic sensibility, is well revealed by the fact that women are seldom bemused by mere beauty in men. Save on the stage, the handsome fellow has no appreciable advantage in amour over his more gothic brother. In real life, indeed, he is viewed with the utmost suspicion by all women save the most stupid. In him, the vanity native to his sex is seen to mount to a degree that is positively intolerable. It not only irritates by its very nature, it also throws about him a sort of unnatural armor, and so makes him resistant to the ordinary approaches. For this reason, the matrimonial enterprises of the more reflective and analytical sort of women are almost always directed to men who lack of pultritude makes them easier to bring down, and what is more important still, easier to hold down. The weight of opinion among women is decidedly against the woman who falls in love with an Apollo. She is regarded at best as a flighty creature, and at worst as one pushing bad taste to the verge of indecency. Such weaknesses are resigned to women approaches senility, and to the more ignoble variety of women laborers. A shop girl, perhaps, may plausibly fall in love with a moving picture actor, and a half-idiotic old widow may succumb to a youth with shoulders like the Parthenon, but no woman of poise and self-respect, even supposing her to be transiently flustered by a lovely buck, would yield to that madness for an instant, or confess it to her dearest friend. Women know how little such purely superficial values are worth. The voice of their order, the first taboo of their Freemasonry, is firmly against making a sentimental debauch of the serious business of marriage. This disdain of the pretty fellow is often accounted for by amateur psychologists on the ground that women are anesthetic to beauty, that they lack the quick and delicate responsiveness of man. Nothing could be more absurd. Women, in point of fact, commonly have a far keener aesthetic sense than men. Beauty is more important to them. They give more thought to it. They crave more of it in their immediate surroundings. The average man, at least in England and America, takes a sort of bovine pride in his anesthesia to the arts. He can think of them only as sources of tawdry and somewhat discreditable amusement. One seldom hears him showing half the enthusiasm for any beautiful thing that his wife displays in the presence of fine fabric, an effective color, or a graceful form, say in millinery. The truth is that women are resistant to so-called beauty in men for the simple and sufficient reason that such beauty is chiefly imaginary. A truly beautiful man, indeed, is as rare as a truly beautiful piece of jewelry. What men mistake for beauty in themselves is usually nothing save a certain hollow gaudiness, a revolting flashiness, the superficial splendor of a prancing animal. The most lovely moving picture actor considered in the light of genuine aesthetic values is no more than a piece of vulgarity. His like is to be found not in the Uffizi gallery or among the harmonies of Brahms, but among the plush sofas, rococo clocks, and hand-painted oil paintings of a third-rate auction room. All women, save the least intelligent, penetrate this impostor with sharp eyes. They know that the human body, except for a brief time in infancy, is not a beautiful thing, but a hideous thing. Their own bodies give them no delight. It is their constant effort to disguise and conceal them. They never expose them aesthetically, but only as an act of the grossest sexual provocation. If it were advertised that a troop of men of easy virtue were to appear half clothed upon a public stage, exposing their chest, thighs, arms, and calves, the only women who would go to the entertainment would be a few delayed adolescents, a psychopathic old maid or two, and a guard of indignant members of the Parish Ladies' Aid Society. 9. Men as Aesthetes Men show no such sagacious apprehension of the relatively feeble loveliness of the human frame. The most effective lure that a woman can hold out to a man is the lure of what he fatuously conceives to be her beauty. This so-called beauty, of course, is almost always a pure illusion. The female body, even at its best, is very defective in form. It has harsh curves and very clumsily distributed masses. Compared to it, the average milk jug or even cuspidor is a thing of intelligent and gratifying design. 
in brief, an object d'art. The fact was curiously and humorously displayed during the late war, when great numbers of women in all the belligerent countries began putting on uniforms. Instantly they appeared in public in their grotesque burlesques of the official garb of aviators, elevator boys, bus conductors, train guards, and so on. Their deplorable deficiency in design was unescapably revealed. A man, save he be fat, that is, of womanish contours, usually looks better in uniform than a mufti. The tight lines set off his figures. But a woman is at once given away. She looked like a dumbbell run over by an express train. Below the neck, by the bow, and below the waist, the stern, there are two masses that simply refuse to fit into a balanced composition. Viewed from the side, she presents an exaggerated S, bisected by an imperfect straight line, and so she inevitably suggests a drunken dollar mark. Her ordinary clothing cunningly conceals this fundamental imperfection. It swathes those impossible masses and draperies soothingly uncertain of outline. But putting her into uniform is like stripping her. Instantly, all of her alleged beauty vanishes. Moreover, it is extremely rare to find a woman who shows even the modest sightliness that her sex is theoretically capable of. It is only the rare beauty who is even tolerable. The average woman, until art comes to her aid, is ungraceful, misshapen, badly calved, and crudely articulated, even for a woman. If she has a good torso, she is almost sure to be bow-legged. If she has good legs, she is almost sure to have bad teeth. If she has good teeth, she is almost sure to have scrawny hands or muddly eyes or hair like oakum or no chin. A woman who meets fair tests all round is so uncommon that she becomes a sort of marvel and usually gains a livelihood by exhibiting herself as such, either on the stage, in the half-world, or as the private jewel of some wealthy connoisseur. But this lack of genuine beauty in women lays on them no practical disadvantage in the primary business of their sex, for it affects are more than overborne by the emotional suggestibility, the Herculean capacity for illusion, the almost total absence of a critical sense of men. Men do not demand genuine beauty, even in the most modest doses. They are quite content with the mere appearance of beauty. That is to say, they show no talent whatever for differentiating between the artificial and the real. A film of face powder skillfully applied is as satisfying to them as an epidermis of damask. The hair of a dead Chinaman, artfully dressed and dyed, gives them as much delight as the authentic tresses of Venus. A false hip intrigues them as effectively as the soundest one of living fascia. A pretty frock fetches them quite as surely and securely as lovely legs, shoulders, hands, or eyes. In brief, they estimate women and hence acquire their wives by reckoning up purely superficial aspects, which is just as intelligent as estimating an egg by purely superficial aspects. They never go behind the returns. It never occurs to them to analyze the impressions they receive. The result is that many a man, deceived by such paltry sophistications, never really sees his wife, that is, as God is supposed to see her, and as the embalmer will see her, until they have been married for years. All the tricks may be infantile and obvious, but in the face of so naive a spectator the temptation to continue practicing them is irresistible. A trained nurse tells me that even when undergoing the extreme discomforts of partuition, the great majority of women continue to modify their complexion with pulverized talcs and to give thought to the arrangement of their hair. Such transparent devices, to be sure, reduce the psychologist to a sour sort of mirth, and yet it must be plain that they suffice to entrap and make fools of men, even the most discreet. I know of no man, indeed, who is wholly resistant to female beauty, and I know of no man, even among those engaged professionally by aesthetic problems, who habitually and automatically distinguishes the genuine from the imitation. He may do it now and then, he may even preen himself upon his unusual discrimination, but given the right woman and the right stage setting, and he will be deceived almost as readily as a yokel fresh from the cabbage field. 10. The Process of Delusion Such poor fools, rolling their eyes in appraisement of such meager female beauty as is on display in Christendom, bring to their judgments a capacity but slightly greater than that a cow would bring to the estimation of epistemologies. They are so unfitted for the business that they are even unable to agree upon its elements. 
Let one such man succumb to the plaster charms of some prancing miss, and all his friends will wonder what is the matter with him. No two are in accord as to which is the most beautiful woman in their own town or street. Turn six of them loose in a millinery shop or the parlor of a bordello, and there will be no dispute whatsoever. Each will offer the crown of love and beauty to a different girl. And what aesthetic deafness, dumbness, and blindness thus open the way for, vanity instantly reinforces. That is to say, once a normal man has succumbed to the meretricious charms of a definite fair one, or more accurately, once a definite fair one has marked him out and grabbed him by the nose, he defends his choice with all the heat and steadfastness appertaining to the defense of a point of the deepest honor. To tell a man flatly that his wife is not beautiful, or even that a stenographer or manicurist is not beautiful, is so harsh and intolerable an insult to his taste that even an enemy seldom ventures upon it. One would offend him far less by arguing that his wife is an idiot. One would, relatively speaking, almost caress him by spitting into his eye. The ego of the male is simply unable to stomach such an affront. It is weapon as discreditable as the poison of the Borgias. Thus, on humane grounds, a conspiracy of silence surrounds the delusion of female beauty, and so its victim is permitted to get quite as much delight out of it as if it were sound. The baits he swallows are not edible and nourishing baits, but simply bright and gaudy ones. He succumbs to a pair of well-managed eyes, a graceful twist of the body, a synthetic complexion, or a skillful display of ankles, without giving the slightest thought to the fact that a whole woman is there, and that within the cranial cavity of the woman lies a brain, and that the idiosyncrasies of that brain are of vastly more importance than all imaginable physical stigmata combined. Those idiosyncrasies may make for an amicable relations in the complex and difficult bondage called marriage. They may, on the contrary, make for joustings of a downright impossible character. But not many men, lost in the emotional maze proceeding, are capable of any very clear examination of such facts. The truth is that they dodge the facts, even when they are favorable, and lay all stress upon the surrounding and concealing superficialities. The average stupid and sentimental man, if he has a noticeably sensible wife, is almost always apologetic about it. The ideal of his sex is always a pretty wife, and the vanity and coquetry that so often go with prettiness are erected into charms. In other words, men play the love game so unintelligently that they often esteem a woman in proportion as she seems to disdain and make a mock of her intelligence. Women seldom, if ever, make that blunder. What they commonly value in a man is not mere showiness, whether physical or spiritual, but that compound of small capacities which makes up masculine efficiency and passes for masculine intelligence. This intelligence, at its highest, has a human value substantially equal to that of their own. In a man's world, it at least gets its definitive rewards. It guarantees security, position, a livelihood. It is a commodity that is mercantable. Women thus accorded a certain respect, and esteem it in their husbands, and so seek it out. End of chapter 2, The Feminine Mind, part 1